Hi everyone, welcome. Um, uh, I am a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Global Asia at um, NYU Shanghai this year, and I'm otherwise based in the Comparative Literature Department at Queen Mary University of London. Um, it's an immense pleasure to introduce today my friend and colleague, Juliana North, who is a professor of East Asian Art History at Free University Berlin, and also a research professor at the China Institute for Visual Studies at the China Academy of Art. Um, her research focuses on Chinese art and visual culture of the 20th century. Um, her first book published in German um, is titled Landscape and Revolution, the Paintings of Shi Lu, um, and that was published in 2009. Um, she's otherwise widely published in a range of journals and edited volumes. Um, and her much anticipated second book um, will be coming out with Harvard Asia Center Press um, this year. Um, and that will be titled Transmedial Landscapes and Modern Chinese Painting. Um, Professor Nott's talk today is titled Shilu's Visit to India in 1955 and the Cosmopolitanism of National Art. Um, it's a particularly timely talk because uh, the Center for Global Asia has been involved in developing a virtual gallery, uh, a VR art gallery, collecting paintings um, of Chinese artists who traveled to India. Um, and among those artists is Shilu. So we're very excited to be hearing from um, a world-renowned expert of the artist um, about Shilu's visit to India in the 1950s. Uh, Juliana, please join me in welcoming her and over to you. Thank you so much, Adira, for your introduction. And I'll share my screen right away. Just a second. Oh, sorry. No, sorry, I have to. I'm actually in the, this is my last slide. Sorry, I just showed it in advance. So this is my first slide. I'm so sorry for, for showing you things that you shouldn't have seen uh, right now. And um, yes, it's my great pleasure to, to be here. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing the VR Art Gallery and um, presenting uh, on, on Shulu, um, who is, uh, yeah, he was the artist I wrote my PhD dissertation on and have always been thinking about ever since. Uh, so it's, it's also a topic which is uh, very close to my heart. Shulu was a Yenan veteran, and in 1955, he was the party secretary of the Xi'an branch of the Chinese Artists Association. And um, when he visited Delhi in 1955, he produced several paintings and sketches that document sites of cultural interest and people from different social backgrounds in realistic portraits. The encounter with Indian culture in 1955 and with Egyptian culture in the following year seems to have sparked in him a renewed interest in Chinese traditional painting. And this interest will lead him away from the realistic modes of painting that you're seeing in these sketches here and towards a more expressive and individualistic uh, form. So this, uh, this, this uh, visit to India, however brief, uh, was um, a very crucial and a decisive moment in his artistic career. And the importance of this, uh, of this cross-cultural encounter for his own work becomes evident in a group of paintings which he had originally painted in India and Egypt and which he revised in 1970 when he was suffering, for, suffering from uh, schizophrenic episodes. He covered the paintings with a new layer of graphic signs and texts through which he construed a common cultural past for China and India. And at the same time, he placed himself in a contemporary world of socialist, artistic, and scientific cosmopolitanism. And this is the process um, I will try to uh, outline in today's talk. Shulu traveled to India and Egypt on official missions and this is reflected in the technique, style, and the subject of 
the paintings he painted there. Uh, he traveled to Delhi as the artistic director of the Chinese Pavilion at the Indian Industries Fair and to Egypt uh, in August 1956 to participate in an exhibition of artists from Asian and African countries. To, uh, and he traveled to Egypt together with his colleague, Zhuang Yun, who was then uh, the director of the Xi'an Artists Association. So it was the, the director and the party secretary slash vice director traveling together. The paintings are typical for what are called, um, or what was then called Taimohua or color and ink painting in, in, the arts, in the artistic terminology of the mid 1950s. And this term stood for the reform of Chinese ink painting, which was previously and afterwards more commonly referred to as Guohua or national painting. Um, so this Taimohua was propagated by leading party members in the art academies and other institutions. And it stood for a painting that was executed in the traditional media. So it's ink and color and paint it on paper and painted with a Chinese brush. But in, it incorporated realist painting techniques such as shading, single point perspective and anatomical drawing. And also it avoided the use of heavy black ink because it was supposed to be colorful, lively and friendly and pleasing to the people. The paintings also reflect one of the main concepts underlying socialist realism, the so-called typical. And the importance of this concept can be traced back to Friedrich Engels, who defined realism as the truthful rendering of typical characters under typical circumstances. In China, it was introduced to a broad audience of artists in the official art magazine Mei Shu in 1954. Um, uh, among others, in an article by the Soviet literary critic uh, German Nedoshevin <clears throat> on the typical and painting. And Nedoshevin uh, started with a quotation by Georgi Malenkov, who was then the, um, the uh, premier minister of the Soviet Union, and uh, who, in, who in this quotation claimed that the typical was not the object most frequently encountered <clears throat> but the object that is able to express the nature of a certain social force in the most exhaustive and the most pointed manner. And he stated that was the basic category through which partiality is expressed in realist art. And that the question of the typical is always a question of politics. <clears throat> Typical can be discerned as the basic principle underlying Shuru's works beginning in the Yan'an period, that is from the late 1940s onwards. And his portraits of peasants and landowners from Northern Chambe um, focus on their occupation and class status, while his pictures of Tibetans from the first half of the 1950s define them through their ethnicity. And similar observations can be made for the images with Indian and Egyptian motifs. Here, the emphasis on the typical turns the focus on national characteristics. So it's from the class status to the ethnic status to the uh, national uh, differences that, uh, that become uh, what is grasped as typical here. And this implies that what is the typical or the marker of the difference is the non-modern, or to put it differently, it is those aspects which are perceived as exotic. And this exoticizing view is not only present in the paintings, but also in a short essay that should be published in 1956, Women Carrying the Sky, Random Thoughts While Sketching During My Indian Travels. And I'm sorry that I'm illustrating this with a picture he made in Egypt, but um, He's, uh, he's writing about women carrying heavy, uh, heavy loads on their head. So um, he, he wrote about this, about Indian women, but he pictured it with uh, Egyptian women. So he describes the images and associations that he had when watching Indian women carrying heavy water jugs, building material, objects collected from rubbish heaps and firewood. The extreme physical labor, even by very young girls, 
However, does not lead him to critique the social and gender specific conditions of these women's poverty. Instead, he, hender, he renders them as heroic and it is through the hardship of their lives that this heroism is accomplished. Schiller refers to their poverty and their living conditions to describe these, these women as beautiful. His text thus conforms to a Maoist aesthetics of poverty and hard labor that brings the most oppressed into the focus of art by means of an aesthetic that inverts conventional norms of beauty. The Indian women are described as um, cast from black iron or copper who straighten their Vajra-like chests and their coarse garments, which are too yellow, too red and too black, only serve to underline the beauty of their crystal black antelope eyes. What is omitted by Shulu in his praise of Indian women is a social critique and instead he frames them in culturalist terms. And one stylistic device which uh, he employs is to draw associations from these women from the lowest echelons of society to pre-modern imperial architecture when he compares the water jars on the women's heads to the domes of the Taj Mahal. This poetic invocation of Mughal architecture can be linked to Shulu's own concern with cultural identity or national forms. <clears throat> Shulu spoke in more detail on the question of national form in a talk that he gave together with Zhao Wang Yun at the Exhibition of Arts from African and Asian Countries in Cairo in 1956. Shi and Zhao de-emphasized the importance of political content and claimed that form and content of an artwork were underlying a distinct law of art, as they phrased it. The beautiful and artistic form was embodied in, I quote, the sublime, uplifting and healthy psychology of the spiritual life of the people of a nation, unquote. Therefore, artistic form can only be developed if arts, quote unquote, inherit and raise the nation's traditional forms. And although national, national form has to be modified in order to convey the changing conditions of life, it still had to follow the course of traditional forms, including popular and elite art forms. This emphasis on national form is in keeping with the renewed recognition of traditionalist painting as part of the precious heritage of our country, uh, that was again a quote, after the Hundred Flowers Movement and the anti rightist campaign. <clears throat> This political shift probably prompted the shift in Shulu's painting away from a realism that centers on the human figure <clears throat> to an increasing engagement with landscape, traditional representational techniques and pre-modern Chinese painting theory. But this shift is also very likely linked to his experience with the cultures of India and Egypt. And although his views of painting subjects are markedly exoticizing, <clears throat> they seem to have contributed to his regarding to to regarding his own painting in culturalist terms as well or maybe we could even go so far to say that he was kind of self exoticizing uh, chinese culture so similar to his romanticizing view of the indian and egyptian women whose beauty was closely linked to their hard work his aim in the following years was to pictorialize a romantic passion for the revolution through the struggle of Chinese peasants with a rough northern landscape, such as the, the, um, the boatmen struggling against the currents of the Yellow River in, in Shanbei that you see here, and the this, this struggle and uh, the, the northerness and the roughness of the landscapes are also reflected in his very forceful and powerful brush strokes that cite uh, uh, Northern style uh, painting from, from the Ming Dynasty, um, so or Northern school painting. Um, so his earlier images of Indian and Egypt, as the one you can see here with the women on the banks of the Nile, with the colorful and half documentary realism, were not able to transport the multiple associations that Shulu recounted in his essay on Indian women. So it, there was this reception of, um, or this, this 
his striving for an artistic way or an stylistic and expressive modes to, to convey uh, these uh, romantic feelings. But I think that this, uh, this um, one could say passionate approach to national identity was not reflected in this more documentary and very realist uh, and perhaps even tame style uh, that you see in, uh, in his paintings from the mid 1950s. Um, so if it was actually the encounter with India and Egypt that led Shulu to a strong engagement with uh, national culture, then it was not incidental that he returned to these travel paintings um, when he pictorially and verbally reclaimed his artistic position in 1970. The revisions of his Indian Egypt and Egyptian paintings were among the first paintings he worked on after his, his hospitalization with the diagnosis of schizophrenia in 1965 and after his subsequent imprisonment in so-called ox sheds uh, during the early years of the Cultural Revolution. The exceptional character of these works results from the circumstance that, I, that they are marked by Schiller's schizophrenic condition, showing a dense graphic structure that obeys an oppressive and desolate impression. But while it is important to take Schiller's mental condition and his political situation uh, in the early years of the Cultural Revolution into account when discussing these paintings, um, my focus will be more on the artistic and discursive issues with which he invested these works. In the paintings and their inscriptions, different discourses of the pre-cultural revolution period run together. And to follow these discursive strands, I will not read these images and text as notations of madness, but as symbols and metaphors that refer to distinct political and artistic positions. When Shulu revised his Indian and Egyptian paintings, he added ornamental patterns and ink textures, and most of all, texts. The texts are not always easy to decipher, and they switch from one discursive level to another. The discourses he draws upon include social critique and the tradition of critical realism, historical critique involving quasi-mythical persons, and political and artistic defiance in response to his own personal situation. All these levels are present in the picture of an Indian sage king. And um, so this probably, um, this picture initially only showed a yogi sitting on a small boulder and holding his long staff. Uh, in front of him. So probably initially it was more or less this person and his staff and uh, everything else was added in 1970. The title under which the painting is normally published, uh, Yindu Shen Wang, is taken from this inscription here, <clears throat> in, uh, which is on the mounting. But on the painting proper in the upper right corner, which is a very common place for a painting inscription, there's another title, which is Liu Liangzhe, or the Vagabond. And this might uh, refer to the itinerant life of uh, the Indian yogi um, outside the conventions of society, but it's also the Chinese title of Raj Kapoor's film Avara of 1951, which was immensely popular all over Asia, and which was shown in Chinese cities during an Indian film festival in 1955. The plot of the film is based on a critique of the notion that birth is decisive for one's social status. And because hereditary class status was very virulent in socialist China, especially during the Cultural Revolution, the title implies a double, a double reference. Through the Indian subject of the painting and the Indian film to which it obviously refers, it simultaneously points at uh, Shulu's own social and political situation in China as a political cadre with a landlord class background. The, the title Liu Langzhe also resonates with Shulu's own recent 
experience when he himself was a vagabond after fleeing the ox shed in 1969 and wandering on the Shanxi Sichuan border, eating the food from the fields and earning money by practicing divination uh, in the villages. This biographical detail can be linked to the inscription right beneath the yogi, written in red seal paste on the black rock he's sitting on. The writing is in strongly archaizing script, including pictograms reminiscent of bronze inscriptions from the Shang and Zhou periods, and an archaizing interpretation of clerical script that retains features of seal script. The text thus has the character of an ancient ritual document, and it consists of fragmented phrases such as heavenly fish, there is only one vagabonding, the divine way in deep blue, and laozi. An interpretation in terms of social criticism suggested by the title Vagabond is also supported by the characters to which, to which the yogi's right hand and staff are pointing. The characters form two names that are entangled with each other, namely Tagore and Tolstoy. Uh, one read from the left and one from the right. So um, it's here covered by the... So here this is... Uh, Torres Stay, and here it's Tai <clears throat> Um And uh, the names are rendered in a sort of expressionist foreshortening of the characters, and or maybe rather an expansion of the characters that makes them appear exclamatory. In the years prior to the Cultural Revolution, Leo Tolstoy was criticized by Chinese authors as a humanist, but all in all evaluated positively as a proponent, proponent of a critical and realist literature under the historical circumstances of his life. The entangling of Tagore's name with, with, uh, with Tolstoy's uh, indicates a reading in a similar vein. Uh, Rabindranath Tagore was presented to Chinese readers mainly as a critic of Indian caste society and of the deprivation of the poor. So, like the reference to Avara, this call for Tagore and Tolstoy can be read as a metaphor for an international critical realism and an understanding of art that was more pluralistic than that of the Cultural Revolution period which was entirely focused on class struggle and therefore highly restrictive. So Indian leftist cinema, Indian and Russian critical yet humanist literature, Taoist mytho-philosophy, and Shulu's personal experience of official travel and desolate vagabonding all run together in the image of this roaming yogi. In the image of an Indian mother with her daughter, religion and social critique are entangled as well. In the inscription that Shulu added in 1970, he indicts the Indian caste system as an instrument of political rule. He then goes on to denounce Shakyamuni as nothing else but a 13th, uh, 13th generation despot who was after young girls in the first place. And while the logic of his argument and his choice of vocabulary are clearly marked by his mental illness, the way in which he combines criticism of modern Indian society and um, historical and religious figures such as Shakyamuni is uh, very similar to the logic of ideological criticism prevalent in Maoist China and during the Cultural Revolution in particular. So because the dominant ideological framework, which can be subsumed under uh, Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, was um, open to interpretation, but it was at the same time taken to be true. So therefore it was used as a blueprint for the evaluation of all cultural and social phenomena. And it could be shifted from modern to historical objects and back. And uh, since this blueprint could be filled with any subject, historical incidents were often used or read as metaphors for contemporary issues. 
So the way in which Shulu here shifts from one historical time to another under his schizophrenic condition is therefore just a very extreme example of a very common uh, discursive practice. The same holds true for the image of the South Gate of the Purana Kila, or Old Fort in Delhi, which Shulu also revised in 1970 and supplied with the new title uh, here um, at the bottom. Um, uh, so the new title reads Cosmic Missile Base, uh, reverently inscribed by Wang Xichi. An illustration of the painting in its unrevised state that was published in the art magazine uh, Meishu in 1956, shows a picturesque and standardized view of the gate that documents the site in a rather touristic manner. But in 1970, Shulu added a complex and minute uh, decor interspersed with Roman letters and added structures uh, to the building. In the long inscription written in red in the upper half of the picture, he refers to the building as the Red Castle or the Lal Kila in Delhi, writes that it was built in the late medieval period and records that he visited the place in 1955. Moreover, he states that Confucius and Lu Ban designed and built the fort together. Thereby, Shulu inscribes the Indian into the Chinese past effectively dehistoricizing de and mythicizing the Mughal period building. Confucius is not referred to as a philosopher, but as a mythological saint who is quasi-identical with Lu Ban, uh, the mythical carpenter and craftsman. And together they become the founding fathers of the arts and the forerunners of Shu himself. So what might be called a transnational and transtemporal fu fusion of an Indian monument with mythical figures that are in turn related to Shulu himself occurs in several of the paintings and most prominently in his own name. So uh, for instance, the character Lu in Lu Ban is the same as in Shulu's name. So um, that the identification uh, between the two or the, of, of Shulu with this uh, mythological predecessor uh, works on, on the level of the names. <clears throat> A further level of uh, signification is introduced through the Roman letters that are inserted in the pictures, uh, but which remain indecipherable since Shulu had no proficiency in Western languages and we therefore cannot trace what he meant when he wrote the letters. But here, as you can see here, they serve as a, as a structural element in, in the construction of uh, the picture. But it becomes um, clear from one signature that he used in some of the pictures in, the, in 1970, that he envisioned himself as part of an international community of artists. And this signature reads um, either Sugar Lu Man or Sugar Lu Man Dan, um, depending on how, how to read uh, this, uh, this character. If this is a, I'm not sure if this is actually a Dan or an N, or, uh, but anyhow, this is definitely uh, not a Chinese uh, name, but a vaguely Russian or German, German sounding name, uh, but which still retains the characters. Uh, and Lu. Shulu also used the signature in a painting that is not part of the revised Indian and Egyptian paintings, but an ambitious hand scroll bearing the title Long Scroll of Flowers and Insects. And the issue of identity is particularly prominent in the opening section of the scroll which consists of a lengthy inscription in Roman characters, which we cannot read, and a number of seals. And these seals were in fact written with a brush and with a cheap fluid seal paint used in office work. Uh, in these seals, he used different names to negotiate different identities. One of these names is uh, Shulu. 
the name he adopted in his early 20s when he arrived in the wartime communist headquarters in Yan'an. Out of, and he adopted uh, these two characters out of reverence for the 17th century painter Shi Tao <clears throat> and the 20th century writer Liu Xun. But here in this painting, he also signs with his original given name, um, Feng Yacheng, and with ninth son of the family, uh, ninth son of the Feng family. And furthermore, he also uses the name of his father, Feng Zirong, in two seals. Hailing from a wealthy land-owning family in Sichuan, he renounced his identity when he joined the communist revolution in Yan'an. But when he was attacked as a counter-revolutionary during the Cultural Revolution, he, ret he retrieved the part of his personality associated with his uh, bad family background. His family had provided him with solid education of classical Chinese as well as Western learning. And it is in this tradition of an internationalized intellectual background that he posits himself with the large seal that forms the center of the opening section. Using his style name, Yong Kang, <clears throat> or so his zi, uh, he refers to an intellectual genealogy that includes Leonardo da Vinci, Ivan Turgenev, Pablo Picasso, and Victor Hugo. And this internationalized genealogy can be linked to the identity of Shigulu uh, Mandan, uh, which I mentioned before, which opens up the Chinese frame of reference of his name Shulu, but it also, he also adds a, a reference to imperial Chinese culture with adding a seal by the uh, Song, Song Dynasty Emperor, Song Huizong. <clears throat> and um, in the following texts of the scroll, um, three frameworks that can be linked to the different aspects of Shulu's identity continually intersect in different ways. The tradition of early Chinese philosoph philosophical writing, what might be called a globalized scientific modernism of European origin, and finally, Shulu's own biographical situation. The scroll consists of four texts written in different script types and divided by images of flowers and insects. In the texts, three frameworks that can be linked to the, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm repeating myself. But anyhow, I'll skip now to the first text, uh, which begins with a fictitious quotation from the preface of a prose poem by Zhuangzi. And um, so also in his inscription, he's imitating the language of, uh, of the Taoist classic. Then it proceeds from a Taoist inspired grand view to the radar of the universe, the atoms of Confucius and the theory of radioactivity and ends with the statement, this is the biological view on birds and flowers, insects and animals, fish and shells of the materialism of Gu Changkang. So what comes into play with a reference to Gu Changkang is another alter ego because Changkang is the style name of the fourth century painter Gu Kaizhi, um, who in art historical texts of the Mao area was heralded as an early predecessor of realist painting in China. Uh, he is not known to have painted animals or flowers specifically, but his zi is very, very similar to that of Shulu. So Shulu's zi is Yong Kang's, and uh, here the shift is just from the first character with the Chang to the Yong, so from long to eternal. In the second text, written in a cursive version of the script of the first text, begins with physics and the Nobel Prize and lists Newton, Edison and Watt, but also again Leonardo and Hugo, along with politicians such as Benjamin Franklin and the great Dr. Sun Yat-sen, who, who were all, I quote, the leading scholars of their times and masters of their fate, unquote. Repeated over and over across the lines are the words great master, scientist, great scientist, and great inventor, and interspersed between these names 
over and over is Shilu's own name as Feng Kang or Feng Gong. <clears throat> the list of the names of scientists, politicians, writers, and painters in the second text invokes the relative internationalism within a socialist framework that was practiced in the early years of the PRC. And this international socialist tradition was closely linked to the Soviet model and was purged by the destructive radicalism of the early cultural revolution, which was equally directed against feudal Chinese culture, bourgeois Western culture, and Soviet revisionism. So we can therefore read this list of names as a decisively political statement. Then in the third and fourth sections of the text, archaism, political critique, and personal expression are very closely linked. In the, third in the third text, ancient cosmological concepts, such as the Wuji, are brought together with science and striking lightning is described as the avant-garde of science that will bring about a, a bright future. The last sentence expresses Shilu's personal desolation when he writes, when will I be able to sing in a voice without pain? And in terms of writing style, the, this uh, third section, Science Han Dynasty steel inscriptions and uh, several characters are emphasized by this heavy use of ink that is combined with transgressions of the columns. So um, this also serves to underscore the dramatic outcry of the last sentence, when will I be able to sing in a voice without pain, in the bold interpretation of the last character year, and um, which can be read as the semantic equivalent of an exclamation mark. And the idiosyncratic and slightly unbalanced rendering of the characters that becomes linked to the emotional state of the author. The fourth and last passage is, uh, is difficult to read because it borrows the pictographic qualities and the destabilization of the character structure from ancient bronze inscriptions and brings them into a cursive form and a very uh, highly in individual interpretation. Shulu not only cites the characteristics of uh, Shang and Zhou period vessels to further enhance the eccentric qualities of his writing, the pictographs furthermore strengthen the archiving mode of the text, which resonates with ancient texts such as the Huainanzi. The inherent paradox in the use of a cosmological language to metaphorically describe a modern situation culminates in the last pictographs. And um, I, I think, so my interpretation of these last lines is um, in beauty and nature, take the God of cosmos as master. For power, take the sun God as master. And here, Shilu's critique of the radical politics of the Cultural Revolution is most outspoken, albeit again in a metaphorical manner, um, because while the God of cosmos may stand for science, the sun god who is associated with political power is more easily identified. He is probably no one else but Mao Zedong, the reddest, reddest sun in our hearts, as ubiquitously repeated and imaged in the propaganda art of the Cultural Revolution period. Inserted between the two, uh, the first two texts is the image of a lush red hibiscus in full bloom, dripping with moistness on its petals around the leaves and stems. The inner structure of the leaves is completely made up of Roman letters written in blue mineral pigment on patches of black ink. So uh, it's maybe difficult to see, but these structures are actually uh, Roman letters or fragmented Roman letters. Poised on a big seal sits a black insect, stretching its antenna and beak towards the flower, seemingly preparing to leap over. That the hibiscus is placed between the first two blocks of text that praise science and artistic integrity suggests a reading of this westernized flower as a symbol of scientific and artistic truth. 
the black insect that stretches towards the flower sits on Shulu's own seal and is therefore associated with his own persona. The second flower is a chrysanthemum painted in jade colored malachite with ink black leaves. No writing appears in the plant this time, but the jutting lines in which the petals are drawn resonate with the preceding running script. Another insect is perched on a blossom, sucking at a petal with its red beak. The last flower is completely painted in lighter shadings of monochrome ink. The sole blossom is drooping and obviously withering. The structure of the petals is composed by fragments of Chinese characters in sealed scripts and of the leaves too. Um, they do not constitute a text, but rather stand for ancient script per se, just as the Roman letters in the hibiscus stand for the European writing system. In this image, the insect, half dragonfly, half butterfly, is mainly drawn in bright red, and the painting, the pattern of the wings is again formed of Roman letters. Although the flower is already withering, its long red beak is still stretching out toward it. And the flower thus inverts the color and the, the semantic scheme of the, uh, of the hibiscus flower in the first, uh, in the first image. If we read the sequence of the flower images together with the text as a narrative structure and related to the historical moment of the Cultural Revolution in China, the first flower can be interpreted as embodying Shulu's own ideals projected on the pre-Cultural Revolution, uh, pre Revolution period. The sexualized imagery of the insects stretching their long beaks towards the blossoms is suggestive of a passionate romantic relationship which over the course of the scroll takes a tragic turn with a withered flower standing for Chinese culture in decay and preyed upon by the red insect. In the postscript to the first text passage, so at uh, this place, Shulu dates uh, the scroll to the day month year zero in the dripping grotto, the shed of mists and rain. He presents himself writing and painting in a dripping shed at the moment zero of his life, unable to sing in a voice without pain. This describes his actual situation in 1970, when he was deprived of his revolutionary authority, the institution he presided, and substantial parts of his painting and writings. He was threatened by imminent further political persecution and mentally ill. Yet at the same time, he identifies with the project of a universal modernity that nonetheless retained national characteristics shared by an international socialist community. This project, which had brought him to India and Egypt in the 1950s, and which had such a strong impact on his artistic development, became impossible as artistic and political options narrowed down during the Cultural Revolution. With the flowers and insect scroll, Shulu turned to literati formats and subjects, taking on the role of an emin, or a loyalist of a fallen dynasty, or in his case, a remnant subject of socialist China before the Cultural Revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ileana, for such a rich talk. Uh, I invite all of the attendees to please raise questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen um, and we'll go through the questions as they come in. Um, as people are thinking um, about uh, the whole range of provocative um, issues that your talk touched upon, I have two brief questions. The first is um, during the 50s period, would you say that India and Egypt were on the whole lumped together in Shrilu's artistic imagination? Like, did he have a distinction, but make a distinction between the two in the 50s? Because I can see later on in the 70s that some of those references to um, Avara, Tagore and so on are very India specific, but it seems like that distinction perhaps came later on. And I wonder whether um, there was a distinction earlier as well. 
Mm. Um, I'm I'm not sure. I guess I I think so because um, so it's 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 um it's not something that is very outspoken. So he he published several articles. So he so, uh, published this article on on the Indian women in uh, in Xin Guangcha. So this was. And uh, then there was um, the travel sketches he did, uh, his and John Yoon's travel sketches were also published. And so it's, I think it was part of what can be this post Bandung period when there was this, um, when there was this exchange with several you know, non-aligned countries. And I think India was probably the, the country uh, with which the, the exchanges were were probably most intense. Um, I know there was um, a, an exhibition with um, Egyptian antiques in in the late fifties in Beijing. So um, and uh, also I must admit I tried, for example, I tried to find news on on the. Um, so I didn't spend very much time digging into the in, digging into the archives, but I failed to to really find information on the exhibition on on African and Asian artists in in Cairo. So um, I'm I'm not I'm not sure. I would say because he really went to these two places, and also because the um, something I'm also wondering. I mean, this ornamental frames that he uses, for example, on the on the mother with her daughter, um, they are kind of reminiscent of more of Indian, you know, pat decorative patterns, and so sometimes they are even um, reminiscent of Tagore's own um, paintings and sketches. Although I'm not exactly sure whether Shulu might have encountered these these paintings when he was in in, in India, um, but it also could be part of, uh, you know, um, so they can also, so, 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 some elements are also reminiscent of, of uh, ancient Chinese um, patterns. So it's, 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 it's difficult to say, but it seems that the Indian connection is more specific uh, than, um, than the Egyptian. And it also appears that more of the Egyptian paintings remained untouched. So That's we have the pyramids and the uh, palm trees. So he 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 revised a, a portrait of a, of a, a young Indian uh, Egyptian sorry <laughs> Egyptian woman who accompanied him on on the visits in Egypt. And uh, but apparently for the rest, it's it's mostly Indian paintings he revised. That's really interesting. Um, I also wanted to ask you about. Um, the the later graphic inscriptions so um you read them as kind of uh pluralizing the kind of realism of the 50s and also as during this restrictive cultural revolution moment as a um a, a, a return to a revival of that earlier internationalist moment but i wonder from a from a non art historian layperson's opinion, I wonder if it's like a comment on realism itself because he takes these very these works that he did in a very realist style and then made them very abstract or surreal in a way. So is it also a kind of um, maybe rejection is too hard, harsh, um, extreme? But is it a kind of comment on verisimilitude or? logic like maybe um yeah is it a comment on on very foundational tenets of realism in a way or is that maybe going too far no i think that's true and that's um uh but it's, so it's kind of a further development uh of what he started doing after he returned from from india and egypt so it's really that there's this change in his personal style which became more and more expressive and more poetic and individualist so his most famous painting is is um in uh, was painted for the museum for of the chinese revolution and it shows mao zedong in so it's 
purportedly it's a his, it's a history painting but so history painting is uh, is a european painting genre and which was then also used in so in socialist realism and but his painting doesn't have a history at all so it's not about you know a battle and some kind of um cathartic turning point or we can't see a narrative going on but it's just a, a, a very large landscape of, of Shanbei. So we have this last plateau and we have the very small figure of Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong as a kind of poetic figure looking over over a red landscape. So it's using the devices of Chinese painting to, to reinterpret what's, uh, what the actual genre of history painting means. So this is very typical of um, what he did in the, in the late 50s and early 60s. And then he became more and more experimental, also in formal, in, in formal ways. And so he was already criticized in 1964 for being too experimental, basically. And this is then when he, so this is uh, what he did uh, in, the, in 1970, it's just the extreme point of this development, what we could say. Um, Danton has a question. Um, Danton, did you want to ask it in person or shall I read it out? You go ahead. Okay, I'll read it out. So um, Danton asks, in your opinion, where should we place Shirlu in the context of other Chinese artists, including Xu Bei Hong, who also drew Indian motifs during the 20th century. Um, so um, it's um, so stylistically speaking, it's what what we see in his uh, sketches and paintings from the which he did when he was in India. Um, this is kind of the outcome of uh, of Xu Bei Hong's um, plead for realism. So Xu Bei Hong was really the proponent of realism in Chinese painting, of reforming Chinese painting and making it more scientific and more documentary. And um, so um, this is uh, we can. It's not a very straight. Uh, that straightforward, but we can kind of construe a, a genealogy of uh, from uh, Republican period realism to socialist re realism, or you know French academic realism to socialist um, realism, and uh, the the reform of of ink painting, uh, in which Xu Bei Hong played a very very crucial role, and um, so. Um, and for for Xu Bei Hong, this meant um, cosmopolitanism, to to uh, to to visit uh, to visit Tagore in India, and um, to to portray him, and to also to so the most famous painting of Xu Bei Hong is uh, Yugong Yishan, which he painted using Indian models that look Indian, and uh, so. Um, and so that that is the kind of cosmopolitanism through realism uh, against this uh, turn to towards national form for after after the anti rightist campaign in China, or of which Shulu can see be seen as a proponent is is sort of poised against. So um, his is rather cosmopolitanism that is defined through the specific national elements and the the. So it's 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 um, yeah maybe dissimulating um, the common the commonalities but strengthening the 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 national characteristics or the cultural uh, heritages of of or the cultural traditions of the of the particular nations um, that's kind of yeah to which I think the visits in India and Egypt inspired Shalou. So by seeing other cultures, he kind of started thinking about his own culture. I've always won. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'll join in uh, and, and uh, ask a follow up. Uh, uh, I, I think this was really fascinating. And, and, and the reason I asked about Shibe Hong and you were going there with regard to pre and post 49, uh, there seems to be two different kinds of realities uh, that uh, people are experiencing when going to India itself, right? I mean, 
uh, Subay Hung's India and, and Shilu's India would have been quite different. Uh, Subay Hung wanted to go to Shantaniketan, and I'm not sure if Shilu actually went to Shantaniketan or not. So they are seeing two different kinds of India within two different kinds of international contexts as well, right? So I, I wonder. And two different kinds of China too. Yes, exactly. Uh, and, and, and so I, I wonder how that reality uh, of, uh, let's say, of a, of a war period, uh, uh, a period that Shibe Hong basically is experiencing with the Japanese uh, expansion and, and the post uh, World War II uh, is having an impact on their understanding of the world itself, right? So uh, as you mentioned, Shibe Hong is looking at Indian figures and drawing this very important story into, into Indian figures, uh, and, and then uh, Shilu going to Egypt and India and, and talking about the woman there, right? So, so what do we understand about the international context of, of Chinese art changing from uh, pre to post 49 uh, in, in these two very, very important artists? Mm, so the, I think the, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, we can only look at these two artists in this case, because there's, so we have this great, these greater trends. And I mean, the, um, for the post 49 period, it is certainly, you know, adopting the Soviet model first, and then starting to, uh, to, um, to leave the post Stalinist Soviet model. And I mean, the, the, a national, the, the, um, the, the phrase of national form is actually also a Stalinist form, interestingly. So it's, um, so it's uh, a turn away. Um, it's, it's in a way, it's, it's turning away from the Soviet bloc and from the cosmopolitanism that this implies, but it's also um, um, uh, opening up certain liberties for Chinese artists or at least for artists working in, in ink, that they don't have to reform their ink painting, but that they can re reinterpret their, their, their own medium in, in ways that say, okay, this is, uh, this is Chinese, but it has always been, had, had uh, realist elements. And so Gu Kaizhi is, is reinterpreted as something, someone who is, uh, you know, expressing the, the spirit through the form. So that is realism. But then realism doesn't have to be the realism of Soviet realism, but can be a Chinese form of realism that, you know, has no, no direct link <laughs> to, to the way we use, the we normally use the term. And Shilu is an extreme example because he was the one who was pushing it furthest, I guess. There are some questions that have come in um, and the first one actually is a question that I also had um, from Shaya. I'll read out. So there's two questions, but I'll read out just the first one for now. Um, when analyzing Shilu's painting, how to take into account both his mental health issues and the political pressure, which might lead him to hide deliberately and rationally his thinking into the composition. And I guess the question for me is also, do you run the risk of ascribing intentionality, given his um, schizophrenia, where maybe there wasn't any intentionality, or do you think there are enough um, bits of evidence there to be able to trace some kind of intentionality? Um, I think it's, um, it's, it's more like the political discourses and the cultural discourses are coming out in, in a disrupted form and but the uh, the the basis is rational, and the um, the discourses are are we could say the real world discourses, but the way he expresses them comes out in an irrational way. So what I'm trying to do is because um, there's there was so much mystifying about these paintings, and you know just reading them at his as heroic expressions of his. Um, of his mind and that he's kind of maybe it's feigned madness and you know the way this has also been proposed for Bada Shanren and and others so that actually the madness might only be a way to um to kind of uh have um 
uh, uh, kind of security net um, for for those expressions. And what I'm trying to do is to mis to demystify um, to demystify these paintings and um, look at them from from an art historical view and to take them seriously and to see okay what is he saying what is he referring to although it's difficult to understand what he's saying and some things he's writing in roman characters and it meant something to him at that time but we have no idea what it meant because we can't <laughs> i mean it's apparently something that went on in his head and we have no way of retrieving this but we have a way of linking uh, these seemingly irrational texts to um to uh to to all those discourses and conflicts of uh of the cultural revolution and also of the um of the 17 years uh, the second question is could you elaborate a little bit more on the relationship between Schuller's practice and earlier transmedial practices especially those exotic paintings of Ye Chen Yu and Huang Xun Qin mm. yeah um i think what's what's maybe kind of common um is this construction of of the other as part of of um of the chinese nation so that the han chinese is the neutral and the ethnic diverse is um is um the yeah the the you know the the ethnic diversity that is integrated but still under uh, the the um ethnically non defined slash han chinese communist party so they actually stand for the people and the diversity of the people but the uh, the communist party and the governments are defined as as neutral and thereby as as Han Chinese and um, I think this is um, definitely true in in Shilu's paintings of uh, of uh, Tibetan minorities and probably also true I mean when when we look at uh, these uh, Indian sketches and I mean he didn't paint modern India I mean, this was 1956, and I'm sure he could have painted modern India. Would have, would that been the thing he was interested in? And uh, but he, uh, yeah, he kind of um, he sought out subjects that looked um, ethnically distinct and pre-modern, or not not part of um, cosmo or global modernity so but they ethnically are nationally distinct and um, this uh, so I, I I'm not sure if this answered your question but I mean yet he was um, there was uh, also because um, he he portrayed these dance dances minority dances but it it was also, I mean, there's um, uh, Claire Roberts's work on on his images or his his dance dancers portraits, who were actually portraits of his wife, who who kind of adopted ethnic dances, and uh, who was um, a dancer. So it's in each case, it's very specific, I think. And Pang Xunqin, who went to Yunnan during the war, um, and uh, kind of found a new uh, or mo maybe also a postmodernist way of of um, thinking about ornaments in uh, yeah in the in the people of Yunnan. Um, so it's it, each case is different, but maybe um, it's uh, yeah. I guess also what's special about Chulu is that he was actually a cadre. So he was um, you know he was a party secretary to 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 begin with. So he was also part of uh, of the government uh, institutions, and so his works are probably more political than the others. Um, this actually leads well to the next question, which is about um, ethnicity in a way. So uh, Zhang Yanqiu asks, did Shulu uh, explore ethnic complexity in his paintings of India and Egypt? 
can we tie that to his understanding of the corresponding situation in China, um, especially in relation to what you discussed regarding Tibet? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think this is basically what I already, I more or less already answered this in, in, in my previous answer. Uh, yes. Yes, I mean, for, for Egypt, we have this uh, portrait of, um, of this modern woman who, who um, accompanied him during his travels, who was a poet. If I, I, I start, also, I, I tried to, to find documentation about her, but I, I didn't manage to. Um, but uh, this is, um, and also the, uh, he, uh, in Egypt, I mean, he apparently he visited the touristic sites. So he, we have the pyramids, we have the Hatshepsut temple, and we have an oasis. So we have more about the very, very, and well, we have the Purana Kila for for uh, for for Delhi, and so it was. Um, so maybe in India it was more about the people, and in uh, in Egypt it was more about the ancient sites. Uh, this is. Uh, maybe a difference we could um, we could see. Um, but, but yeah, and with the Tibetans, this is really because he, his images of Tibetans were made along um, the railroad construction. So he visited the, the construction site of the Lando Urumqi railway and uh, documented this and his first uh, painting were with which he was, um, kind of became famous is called Outside the Ancient Great Wall and it shows um, Tibetan um, herdsmen or you know uh, or just a Tibetan family who is kind of um, who is uh, somersaulting and falling to the ground and laughing uh, because the the first train is arriving on the tra new tracks that break through the Great Wall so it's kind of um, the um, so the the Tibetans are are, are represented as a backward but happy people who who frolic uh, when they hear the sound. So the, the the train itself is not shown, but we know that it's arriving from the reaction of these Tibetans. So this is this kind of exoticizing way of showing uh, socialist modernity arriving at the periphery of the empire. We have a question from Ian Yu who asks um, if there are any references to cosmopolitanism in Shuru's painting colophons. And in your um, point of view, what's the difference between cosmopolitanism and multiculturalism in the eyes of 20th century Chinese painters? Mm, yeah, well, he's not... Um, so cosmopolitanism and multiculturalism, I think it's two very different concepts. So cosmopolitanism is really about participating in um, kind of globally disseminated um, cultural discourse and being part of a community um, of writers, thinkers and artists and on, on, on the intellectual level and multiculturalism is more about the, the simultaneity or the living together of people of different cultures next to each other. Um, so one is very much, uh, maybe cosmopolitanism is, is working more on, 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 on an imagined um, level, especially for someone who, who is stuck in, in, in a dripping shed and unable to move and but kind of imagining him as part of this larger intellectual and artistic community and i mean he doesn't use the word so this is uh something that i'm reading into into him but i think from the multiple references to a very very international um, community of artists and scholars uh, that he's referring to in his inscriptions, I think um, this um, can be claimed. Um, I just want to say about your earlier point about um, 
the fact that Shuru did not paint modern India and was fixated on these pre-modern images and, and tropes. Um, this was actually a very prevalent problem in all of Chinese cultural diplomacy in India. In fact, on the Indian side, people were very frustrated that the Chinese delegates would never mention anything about the contemporary state of India. They only ever talked about ancient India and the 2000 years of friendship with China, and they never mentioned Gandhi or Nehru or anything that was happening currently. Um, I think for the delegates, it was just a, a self-preservation moment of you know, way of not mistakenly saying something that was too controversial because even though there was this era of friendship between China and India, things were always very tense. There were always these unspeakable things. You couldn't talk about Tibet, things like that. So these artists who now had become diplomats were just trying to stay or steer clear of anything potentially controversial. But on the India side, there's, you know, in the archival materials that Tansen and I and some others have been looking at, there's a lot of confusion about, and people are upset that the Chinese delegates don't seem to ever be making any kind of acknowledgement of how much progress or modernity or anything like that um, has happened in India during the visit. Yeah, because then they also would have to talk about the progress and the modernity of China. And so, uh, and because it's, then it would also have been very difficult to find common grounds. Uh, so when you, when you talk about the 2000 years, it's, it's very abstract and you can talk about Buddhist art or you can talk about forms. And so what was the role of, so Tagore was the last person that could be claimed as a modern identifier. <laughs> Ident common denominator? Or what, yeah, what I, guess so. I guess so. Yeah, you're right that it was fundamentally two completely different kinds of nations in the 50s, these new nations that were emerging. They were two completely different parts that they had chosen, and yet they were trying to find similarities. So it was too fraught to do that in the contemporary moment. Um, if there are no other, oh, there's sorry, one other question that I missed. Um, could you please introduce the evolution of the painting techniques and aesthetics and both Shrulu's intercultural aesthetic appropriation, but maybe also his historical dialogue with traditional Chinese painting? Yeah. Um, so I, I just added one of his landscape paintings into my slides. And um, so what he started doing is to think about a way, because he was also, he was based in Xi'an. So he kind of was responsible for finding a regional identity and a regional um, painting style that was characteristic of, of Shanxi. And um, so he, um, he organized a group of painters who were all in the, in the, um, in the Chinese Artists Association and he organized excursions uh, to, to Shanbei and to, to the suburbs of Xi'an. And, um, and then he, um, he can also, I think, because of his personal interest. So he was kind of interested in the heroic and in the expressive modes. And uh, then he, he had this kind of so there's the northern school of painting which is actually not not north chinese it's not a north chinese school but it's um i mean certainly many of you are aware that this is a construct that uh, dong chi chang um, formed in the late uh, ming dynasty about the southern and northern schools which are equivalent to the southern and northern schools of chan buddhism so the northern school is the one that uh, is um, gradual enlightenment and which didn't find any followers in afterwards. So it's it was the southern school that became dominant, and in in Dong Chitang, so the um, the northern school in painting would be the professional painters, the academic painters, and so um, so southern Song and Ming academic paintings and Zhe school painters, which were more expressive and had this very this flourish and uh, working with very powerful brush strokes and um, and uh, Shulu 
kind of claimed this tradition and interpreted it as, as Northern. So it's an, uh, a Northern painting style that he adopted to paint Northern landscapes and um, to, to, to paint these very powerful and very roughly painted landscapes of, of, uh, of, of Northern Shanxi, of Shanbei. And then, um, inserted into these landscapes are not scholars as there would be in, in traditional uh, Chinese paintings or classical landscapes, but uh, peasants or shepherds that were kind of struggling for survival in, in these landscapes. So it's, it's, it's very much like these Indian women who are heroic and beautiful because they are doing performing hard labor. It's uh, the peasants that are struggling uh, in these very harsh and poor, uh, Shambay landscapes that become uh, heroes of the revolution. Um, so this is um, basically uh, what uh, what he became famous with uh, from fifty nine to sixty two, and then he started even using landscape painting modes in, in in figure painting, and also became more and more reduced in his form. So he was, um, yeah maybe even on the way to, to abstraction. So be, you know, concentrating on, on the essential uh, aspects of, of painting. So he became, well, maybe not uh, abstract, but more and more non-realist. And, um, but at the same time, interpreting these in socialist terms, because he was a convinced, he was not only a cadre, but he was also very convinced communist. So this was something of, uh, yeah, which may easily be perceived as a contradiction in his character, but it's actually two parts of his artistic personality. All right, thank you so much for this very enlightening talk and for patiently answering all these questions. Um, I'm sure all of the audience joins me in thanking you and I'm looking forward very much to your book coming out later this year. Thank you so much, Adira, and thank you everyone for your questions and for, for being here today. And I hope we can meet in the future in, in Shanghai. Yes, we, we are waiting for that. <laughs> thank you, Julian. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Adira. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.